<laughs> Hello! Welcome, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our names are Ammon, Topher, wherever we are, Micah, and we are the Three, Three Brothers. Brothers! And welcome to this week's Come Follow Me discussion. We're going to give you our favorite insights, and then we talk about them. That's what we do here, and as always, everything we discuss and talk about is free, and you'll find links below the video uh, that link to our weekly readings uh, for free, and also the insights that we're going to talk about is also in its own document, and that's free too. That's what we like. Um, in the weekly readings, you'll find the Come Follow Me manual in black. You'll find the scriptures for the week in gold, and you'll find the other church manuals in purple. And it's all nicely ordered, so you don't have to go looking anywhere else. It's all there. Just come on down, and it's right there, and read it. And it's a great thing to study, and we highly recommend it. Um, Ashley puts that together for us each week, and we very much appreciate it. And uh, Ashley or others, uh, other friends of the channel, also upload that uh, to YouTube and they read it. They read it out and record it and upload it to YouTube. So if you'd rather read it, like, like sorry, if you'd rather listen to it, you can also find that on our channel. Uh, and that's what we do here. That's what we do here. So without further ado, do he's coming at you, you. All right. Well, this is where we find out that I didn't click record or something because that seemed like a perfect intro. So let's hide. Nothing's been screwed up by me yet. We are ready to rock and roll. Okay. So, Uno Wano, uh, in the language of me. Okay. Insight number one from the student manual for the Church of Jesus Christ Latter day Saints, Enos. It says, could not lie. And it's, so, the student manual here says, faith in God's absolute and perfect truthfulness was a key to Enos's acceptance of the remission of his sins. Enos said he knew God could not lie. So when the Lord said, thy sins are forgiven, the Enos believed it. Joseph Smith taught that a knowledge of the existence of God's tr truthfulness is necessary. Quote, and lastly, but not less important to the exercise of faith in God is the idea of the existence of the attribute of truth in him. For without the idea of the existence of this attribute, the mind of man could have nothing upon which it could rest with certainty. All would be confusion and doubt, but with the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity, in the mind, all the teachings, instructions, promises, and blessings become realities, and the mind is enabled to lay hold of them with certainty and confidence, believing that these things and all that the Lord has said shall be fulfilled in their time, and that all the cursings denunciations and judgments pronounced upon the heads of the unrighteous will also be executed in the due time of the Lord. And by reason of the truth and veracity of him, the mind beholds its deliverance and salvation as being certain. End quote from the student manual here and lectures on faith 416. It references right there. Okay, so <clears throat> there are two things I want to draw attention to here when reading this student manual. The first one was, once again, the student manual for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints says, quote, Joseph Smith taught, dot, 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 end quote, and then proceeds to, quote, as the reference, Lectures on Faith 4. Membership within the church continues to baffle me with the Lectures on Faith, with half the members wanting to almost scream, the Lectures on Faith aren't doctrine, and Joseph Smith had nothing to do with them. And that same half also seemingly quoting the lectures on faith all the time as Joseph Smith Jr., apparently not realizing the quote is, in fact, from the lectures on faith like above. I can't tell you how many times I've heard an apostle or prophet quote the following quote. Now I want you to, as a listener to, to hear this quote and then go, oh yeah, I've heard that, and that's a Joseph Smith Jr. quote. Okay, well, let me read it to you. Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has the power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. It was through this sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life, and it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things 
that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God, end quote. What you might not know is that that's from Lectures on Faith, Lecture 6. Well, my question is, which is it? Is that a Joseph Smith quote or not? And if it is, like it constantly is quoted by apostles and prophets at General Conference and by members of the church, then the Lectures on Faith are Joseph Smith Jr.'s. Now, I only draw attention to this because the Lectures on Faith are one of the most powerful document lectures I've ever read in my entire life. And to see them continue to be maligned by members of the church who think articles written by random members of the church, which appear on the church's website, somehow make it doctrine and the official position of the church. Hint, it doesn't. Don't let the Joseph Smith Jr. Lectures on Faith pass you by unnoticed. And God forbid you let them go unnoticed because you're reading about near-death experiences or alien den tribes instead. God forbid. The second thing I want to draw attention to with this is the second reason I want to draw attention to this is because of how important developing faith as the brother of Jared is and how closely that relates to the lectures on faith and what we learn in them about the attributes of God. Having faith as the brother of Jared is having faith in the past, in the scriptures and God, such that we know that if God blessed his people in the past, we know today that if we do the same works, we will obtain the same blessings. This is actually uh, made possible because of a combination of three attributes of deity, which we learn about in the lectures on faith. One, knowing that God cannot lie, which is what we just went over. Two, knowing that God does not, in fact, cannot change. And three, knowing that God is not a respecter of persons. Now, if we know those three things really deep down in the fleshy tablets of our hearts, know those three things. Then we can, as we read the scriptures, develop faith as the brother of Jared. For if God isn't a respecter of persons and he doesn't change and he cannot lie, well then, what he did for his people in the past, he will do for me today if I will but do the same works. Then when we read stories like Enos, like we did this week, we no longer read it as simply a story, but as an example of how to make one's calling and election made sure. If it worked for Enos, it will work for us. In Hebrews chapter six, we read, for when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself saying, surely blessing, I will bless thee and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the souls, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that which within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then here, finally, a quote from Joseph Smith Jr. talking about the ancient saints obtaining promises, and this is going to tie together everything that I've gone over so far, uh, including the attributes of God and having faith as a brother of Jared and the story of Venus. Most assuredly, Joseph Smith says, it is, however, that the ancients, through though persecuted and afflicted by men, obtained from God promises of such weight and glory that our hearts are often filled with gratitude that we are even permitted to look upon them, like the story of Enos here, and, and having one's calling an election mature. While we contemplate that there is no respect of persons in his sight, once again, went over that, and that in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is acceptable with him, that's our faith as a brother of Jared, but from the few items previously quoted, we can draw the conclusion that there is to be a day when all will be judged of their works and rewarded according to the same, that those who have kept the faith will be crowned with a crown of righteousness, be clothed in white raiment, be admitted to the marriage feast, be free from every affliction and reign with Christ on the earth, where, according to the ancient promise, 
They will partake of the fruit of the vine new in the glorious kingdom with him. At least we find that such promises were made to the ancient saints. And though we cannot claim these promises, which were made to the ancients, for they are not our property, merely because they were made to the ancient saints. So once again, it's their calling and election was made sure, right? Not ours. Yet, if we are the children of the Most High and are called with the same calling and which, with which they were called and embrace the same covenants that they embraced and are faithful to the testimony of our Lord in the same ways, once again, we're describing faith as the brother of Jared again, as they were, we can approach the Father in the name of Christ as they approached him and for ourselves obtain the same promises. Once again, faith in Brother Jared. Faith is Brother Jared. Say, this is what we're teaching over and over again. These promises, when obtained, if ever by us, will not be because Peter, John, or Enos, and the other apostles with the churches at Sardis, Pergamos, Philadelphia, and elsewhere walked in the fear of God and had power and faith to prevail. Once again, um, Israel is let God prevail or those that prevailed with God and obtain them right? They became Israel. They let God prevail. They prevailed with God, but it will be because we ourselves have faith and approach God in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, even as they did. Once again, he's really trying to hammer home here. Faith is brother Jared. And when these promises are obtained, they will be promises directly to us or they will do us no good. They will be communicated for our benefit, being our own property through the gift of God, earned by our own diligence in keeping his commandments and walking uprightly before him. If not, to what, to what end serves the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and why was it ever communicated to us? Uh, end quote. And end of my insight. What a lesson. That was good. <clears throat> um, all right, I took a bunch of notes down here. All over the place. So let's see how we go here. So first, I just wanted to say, have you guys seen, and forgive me for going off on this tangent, but have you guys seen, uh, I think it's Thor, Love and Thunder. <laughs> have you seen that movie? No, Michael hasn't. I haven't seen it. It's probably one of the worst Marvel movies. Um, anyway, Michael hasn't seen it, so it's hard to describe. But there's a there's a part in there, and Christian Bale is in that one. I believe it's Thor, Love, Love and Thunder. But anyway, Christian Bale is very sad. Christian Bale's in there. He's this guy. He's like a he worships God. You know, they, they're God in the in the, in the in that movie. Um, and um, and his daughter's dying, and they're dying of dehydration. And his daughter dies, and he's clambering his way across this desert. And he finally makes it to this oasis, and he finally actually makes it to this God, his God that he's been praying to. And he makes it to him, and the God's got all his fruit, and he's having a great time. And by you know the God is, and um, he gets there, and he drinks water, and he eats, he's grabbing fruit, and he's eating, and then he, he's pleading to the God, like, why you know why didn't you help save my daughter or, you know, just want some mercy. And the God doesn't care. You know, he's like, oh, I don't, I don't care. Get out, you know, get away from me. You know, this kind of, and just maybe think as you're saying this, like, it's so nice to know that that's not our God. It can't be our God. It never will be our God. Is that if we, if and when we are able to see him, his level of like, what well, our level of love for him firstly, and his level of love back is perfect. Like, um, but he does care, and he, and uh, anyway, like <laughs> that turns that man into like a a god killer, right? He gets very very angry and upset, obviously. But um, anyway, the point the point I'm trying to make here is that um, there's something really comforting in in you're talking about the faith of, the faith of the brother of Jared. There's something really comforting in that for us, obviously. Um, that knowing that no matter what we can trust in God, right? Like that we, we just need to know him. We just need to, um, we can look at the past. We can, we can, we can look in the scripture. We know that he's unchangeable, that he is perfect. How do you, how do you improve on perfection? This is why God doesn't change. You can't improve on perfection, right? So, um, it's, not, it's just so comforting to know that we have the same rights and privileges and blessings available to us that anyone in scripture did or does. Um, and that when we do and we'll see him, that he will be merciful to us, that he does love us, that he does want the best for us and that he loves us like a father loves his son, but even more so, even better. Um, and um, what else do I have here? 
And oh, I can't remember where you said it in here, but it was good. It was something about um, us having faith and trust in the love of God, but also the judgments of God. Uh, like uh, maybe it was in the Genesis of the quote there. Um, but it's something interesting to consider is that not only like is God's love and and um, care for us perfect um, and we can have full faith in that, but we can obviously have full faith and trust in the fact that his judgment will come to pass too, you know? So that's, that's also something to consider. So there's this thing that, yes, obviously he loves us more than anything, but also his judgments are, uh, there's no escaping that. So his his love doesn't outweigh that, you know, in in a, in, a, in a way like they they can they coincide at the same time. They have to co to coexist. Um, so that's very interesting as well. So there's no escaping judgment for sin and our obedience. I think right at the end there, you're talking about our obedience, um, our own diligence in keeping his commandments and walking out rightly before him, um, is how we'll have these promises obtained. And so. Even though he he probably loves us, well, definitely probably loves us more than he wants to judge us, if that makes sense. The judgment still has to come to pass. Um, and I just wanted to say, there's another. Let's see another thing. Like on, on Instagram, the church's Instagram account. Again, they have all these videos. I always see them every week on Instagram. And the one they had this week was a girl, and she was saying, <clears throat> "I know Jesus Christ, you know, loves us all, and he sacrificed himself for everyone." And um, and, and did all these things for us, but except for me, right? Like she couldn't fathom that he did it for her. And um, and we've talked about that before, like how sometimes, and the, the point I'm making here is that it is, you know, it is the same for all of us, but sometimes we still go, oh, you know, I'm somehow different. It doesn't count for me. We can be really down on ourselves. Um, but if we're like that, we don't truly understand that we are all the same. We are all in the same boat. We all have the same power, privilege, um, you know, um, capability to gain the blessings of God if we do the same things that, let's say, as it was talking about there in that last quote from Joseph Smith, the ancients did. Um, the miracles that happened to the ancients, the amazing miracles, we may, we you know, often we say, why are there no great and same miracles anymore? We know there shortly will be some of the greatest miracles to come ever, firstly. Um um, but even in the early days of the church, in some of the the temples and such, like in Kirtland and, and so forth, there were some pretty amazing miracles there as well and to some of the early saints. Um, and so we may not think we see them that often, but the fact of the matter is that they're available to us as well. The miracles that, that can happen, they're available to us as well, according to our faith, right? Whether it's is it faith as a brother of Jared, what's happened in the past can happen again, you know, what, you know, What's happening in scripture can happen for us. And maybe we're not, maybe we're not there as a church. You know what I mean? I don't know. But what I'm trying to get at, and sorry if this is a big one big rambling, but we will get there because they are coming, those miracles. Um, and really the only reason we don't have things that we like 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 miracles like that is because probably of our lack of faith. Um, unfortunately, we have to probably put put it back on ourselves. Um, anyway, so Long story short, too long didn't listen version. Um, God loves us. <laughs> and uh, the beautiful thing about God and is knowing that he's unchanging and perfect, just the ability to have full trust and faith in him that, uh, and we can rely on him. There's a beautiful comforting knowledge in that. It's honestly really comforting to know that if we're just obedient and, uh, and, and do what's right, we will get, the same blessings that we've seen in miracles and in the scriptures for, for other people in the past. And it's um that's really, really consoling because like that girl in that video saying, sometimes we can be hard on ourselves and think, yeah, everyone, but not me. And it's not true. You know, when you were talking there, Dover, I just realized once again, one of the reasons, the, the biggest reasons for me, why I love the church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints. I love knowing things like I, I love like when the gift of the Holy Ghost reading, reading the New Testament and actually reading about the gift of the Holy Ghost, but laying on hands. What does that mean? Like, what does that mean? Oh, well, we have a definition there. It, uh, we actually know what that means. You don't have to be ignorant. We know specifically what that means. And 
And uh, and one of these things was, you know, having faith as a brother Jared. And it's like, how many people use the, ter the, the these terms today and they just don't even know what they mean in the church? Like they they say, oh, faith to brother Jared. Well, what does that mean? Do you know what that actually means? All it just means to have faith. Well, then why wouldn't they just say have faith? Like what is faith as the brother of Jared? Well, it just means a lot of faith. What is what, what that doesn't make sense, right? Like, oh, it just means to have a the gift of the Holy Ghost is like to have a, a lot of it, just in a bigger quantity. It's like, ah, you know, I, so I love the, the the church and I I will for I will forever be grateful to Joseph Smith Jr. in being the revelator to restore these truths in the last day. And it just breaks my heart how many of these definitions, how many of these plain and precious truths that we have that we just don't even take the time to learn. We just don't even take the time to learn. So, but yeah, I love that. So anyway. Mm. Yeah, a great point and it has a lot of connections to, actually, firstly, can you hear me with the earphones on? Okay, cool. Yeah, it has a lot of connections to my next point. Firstly, the lectures on faith, the point that you made on that is great. Joseph Smith is the best and obviously he was, he was behind the lectures on faith and so we need to get into those. Knowing that God can't lie and that he doesn't change is so critical because if you didn't believe that, if you didn't trust in that, how do you have faith in anything? <laughs> Nothing. You can't have faith in anything if you don't really believe in that. Faith is a brother of Jared. Great point. And I, I dive into that in a way in my point as well. And I really like that quote that you gave from Joseph Smith on the ancient saints obtained promises. Just because the ancient saints obtained promises... It doesn't mean that we will be eligible to them unless we obtain the same level of faith that they did in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can't, it, it, that's a really great point because I think there's a lot of members of our church today that think because I've joined the house of Israel, because I've joined the church, I've been baptized, I've joined the church, I've made covenants. I am now washed clean of the blood and sins of this generation and there's no improvements that I need whatsoever. And I have obtained the promises made to the ancients. And that simply is not true. There needs to, you need to rise to the level of faith and knowledge and, and power and worthiness and all those things that those ancients rose to in order to be eligible for those promises to be sealed upon them by the Holy Spirit of promise and then live the rest of their lives worthy of the receipt of those blessings. Um, Evan, you can do your point now if you want, if it makes sense to do it now. Otherwise, uh, it's a little bit different. That's fine. Okay. You can go ahead and, and do yours. It's all good. All right, cool. Nice. Okay. So firstly, one thing I've noticed is that I've always pronounced Enos as Enos. And I noticed Micah says Enos. So that's fun. Enos. Is that how you say it, Emma? <laughs> I say Enos, Enos most of the time. Okay. Enos is way um, too Australian for me. I say Enos. E Enos. Yeah. Um, okay. So... <laughs> Uh, so I'm using, as as often one of us does, I'm using the very first thing mentioned in the Come Follow Me manual this week. Um, and it says, although Enos went to the forest to hunt beasts to satisfy physical hunger, he ended up staying there all day and into the night because his soul hungered. This hunger led Enos, there you go, I'm saying it the right way apparently, yeah, to raise his voice high that it reached the heavens. He described his, this experience as a wrestle before God from Enos, we learn that prayer is a, a, a sincere effort to draw near to God and to seek to know his will. When you pray with this intent, you are more likely to, to discover, as Enos did, that God hears you and truly cares about you, your loved ones, and even your enemies. When you know his will, you are better able to do his will. Like Mormon, you may not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things. Wherefore, he worketh in you, to do according to his will. I just thought there's a few real gold bits mentioned in there. Um, I'm just going to read the first four verses of Enos. Behold, it came to pass that I, Enos, knowing my father, that he was a just man, 
for he taught me in his language and also in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And blessed be the name of God for it. And just having read that right now, throws me right back to 1 Nephi 1, 1, doesn't it? Isn't that very similar? Very, very interesting the way that that started, the same as Nephi started here, saying that, you know, my father taught me well in his in his religion, in his writing, in his, you know, you know very interesting. Um, and I'll tell you of the wrestle which I had before God, before I received a remission of my sins. Behold, I went to hunt beasts in the forest, and the words which I had often heard my father speak concerning eternal life and the joy of the saints sunk deep into my heart. And my soul hungered, and I kneeled down before my maker, and I cried unto him in mighty prayer and supplication for mine own soul. And all the day long did I cry unto him, yea, and when the night came, I did still raise my voice high that it reached the heavens. The church manual for this says, Enos did not wrestle with God. The record states that Enos wrestled before God in prayer. Such wrestling is the struggle to find and express one's real desires under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And this is what really stuck out to me. Praying in this manner requires that a person eliminate vain, trite, or insincere repetitions to pour out the deepest desires of his or her heart into words. How often do we actually do that, honestly? Each phrase becomes an expression of yearning and desire to do God's will. Such prayers are assisted and guided by the Holy Spirit. That's interesting. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's in Romans 8.26. And then it says, Enos's choice of words in Enos uh, verses 3 to 4, sunk deep, hungered, cried, mighty prayer and supplication, raise my voice high, effectively shows his efforts to truly communicate with the Lord. So this this made me think about a certain thing, I've, and I'm pretty sure I've talked about this. I feel like it was probably at least a year ago. It was a long time ago. Um, anyway, I'll just read my, my, my point here. But yeah, I've talked about this a fair while ago, the, the difference of praying out loud. And it's not just about praying out loud. It's it's not just about that itself, but there is a definite difference with it. Um, I made a commitment to myself last time. I talked about this to try and do it more myself because I've realized that I don't ever do it. Um, and I have done it more myself since then, but certainly not to the extent that I would have wanted to have done it. And it can be quite hard to find actual time alone and somewhere private enough to actually do it where you can feel comfortable enough to actually do it. But... And so what I found is I'll do it in my car. Um, to everyone listening to this, when was the last time you prayed out loud and raised your voice? And I'm talking I'm not talking about something like a prayer at dinner where we pray with other people around. Not that, not the, not then. But when was the last time that you prayed out loud and raised your voice high that it reached the heavens? Or have you ever even tried? Can you remember the last time you did it? For those who have, I would expect, like me, you notice a vast difference between praying in your head silently versus praying out loud. There is literally a very big difference. Because if you're anything like me, we have a tendency when praying in our heads to use vain, trite, or insincere repetitions. And I don't know that there's any escape from that because we do a lot of praying. But when you vocalize your prayers, it's just not the same. You don't use, I mean, at least me, I do not I do not speak the same way at all. Straight away, you're not speaking the same way at all. Because it's real. It becomes real. It becomes a conversation almost. You hear yourself. The words are real. There's a noticeable difference in intent. And it talked about intent up there. Uh, and the Come Follow Me manual points it out. It's more real. It's more personal. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then I suggest you give it a try. And like I said before, the, I really find the only place I can do that is in my car. So sometimes I even do it while I'm driving to work. Um, and man, it's different, man. It's different and it's great. Um, I just also wanted to point out that Enos mentions that he learned from his father. And I just want to say that growing up, I walked in on my dad praying on his knees many, many times. And do you think that might hold some weight and teach its importance to a young boy? You know, knowing that your father who, in my case, and I, I would not say everyone's like this, but in my case, my dad was, I guess, even... Um, subconsciously, unconsciously, whatever the word would be, um, kind of my hero. I think I've mentioned before, probably growing up, he would be probably my hero, but I probably wouldn't have realized that um, until in the past couple of years. But um, do you think that seeing your hero, let's say, on his knees praying to God, um, 
might hold some weight and might and might teach teach a young boy some things. Um, and I only mention this so that we can see the importance of our examples to our children in teaching them the importance of prayer um, and having that real intent, praying mightily and teaching them that it's not weak to rely on the Lord and to get on our knees and bow before him in mighty prayer, in you know that real mighty prayer. Um, and what did Enos gain with his mighty prayers? He gained peace to, to the soul, a remission of his sins, the voice of the Lord in his heart and mind, divine guidance and blessings for his posterity and his enemies. And so I just want to say, let's make our prayers mighty. And I, 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 get, I again urge everyone to try and find some time and, and pray out loud. And literally, you'll, you'll notice the difference straight away and pour your actual soul out to the Lord. I mean, it's it's honestly great. I can't recommend it enough. Um, and I just want to end like with this one Neil A. Maxwell quote that I found in the manual, which I thought was really cool as well. It's about prayer, a slightly different tangent, but I thought it was a really good quote. Um, so Neil A. Maxwell, the core of the 12 apostles, compared receiving answers to prayers to the opening of a combination lock. It's a step-by-step -step process. Petitioning and prayer has taught me again and again that the vault of heaven, with all its blessings, is to be opened only by a combination lock. One tumbler falls when there is faith, a second when there is personal righteousness, the third and final tumble fall, falls only when that is when what is sought is in God's judgment, not ours, or right for us. Sometimes we ponder, so, so sometimes we pound on the vault door for something we want very much and wonder why the door does not open. We would be very spoiled children if that vault door opened any more easily than it does. I can tell, looking back, that God truly loves me by inventorying inv inventorying the petitions He has refused to grant me. Our rejected petitions tell us much about ourselves, but also much about our flawless father. I just thought it was a really great, great, great way of looking at it. Um, but again, if we just make our prayers mighty as much as possible, maybe we got a better chance of opening the vault door. Really good point. When I went through that, that opening paragraph of come follow me this week, I couldn't help but think of Jeffrey R. Holland's talk at the recent general conference, motions of a hidden fire and Micah and some other members of Zion bus did break that down this week, earlier in the week. And it was a wonderful breakdown. So if anyone has a time and, and wants to dive into a little bit more of what Elder Holland was explaining, I would definitely recommend that. But he said some wonderful things about prayer. He really the whole talk was effectively about the benefits and the, and the miracles involving angels and, you know, that that will get involved when we pray sincerely and not amiss. And in that, he said, when we don't know how or exactly what to pray for, we should begin and continue until the Holy Spirit guides us into the prayer that we should be offering. And I don't know about you guys, but I've, I think most of us will have experienced that a lot of our prayers can be repetitious repetitious we say a lot of the very same prayers a lot of similar prayers and it's not that we're not doing it right or it's not that we're not um being sincere you know we're trying to be sincere but there is something very special about praying until you start to receive inspiration as to what you should be praying for and praying about there's something very genuine that comes out of that you know when you're praying for a while when you're allowing time and you're allowing space for the spirit to work and you're allowing space for you to think and remember, you know what I mean? Like you, it, it's like when you have, when you're having, when I, when I go into the office, this is a better example. When you go in the office and every day someone goes, Hey, how you going? You go, yeah, good. How are you? And they go, yeah, good. If you only had those conversations, those 30 second conversations with people saying, yep, I'm good. Yep. I'm good. But the truth is not really that you're good. It's just that you can't be bothered talking to each other. You don't really, you're not really connecting. There's no depth. There's no relationship. There's something very different when you catch someone and they say, hey, how you going? You go, yeah, good. Actually, I just want to tell you about something. And they get real with you for a minute and you have a real proper conversation. There is a difference that happens. A real bond begins to develop. Care and concern is shared. If there's a way that you can help them, you will want to help them if, you know, with their problems or, 
or give them feedback or advice and you start to care about them. I just think it's the exact same thing with Heavenly Father. And the difference is that when we come to him and we have that wrestle before him, he's ready to grant us every all the righteous desires of our hearts if they be right for us. You know, he's ready to pour out blessings. He's ready to do miracles. He's ready to release his angels to, to watch over us and protect us and take care of us. He's ready to do all those things in his time and in his way. But we have to we have to put in the work. We have to ask not to miss. We have to be honest. We have to open up. We have to share how we really feel. And I think spending more time praying and allowing the spirit to work with you and help you open up changes things. It just does. Oh, the last thing I'll say is I found dad around the house randomly all the time praying on his knees. And that has had a lasting eternal effect on me. Yep. So, yeah, I was going to mention the, the talk breakdown as well that, uh, that Ammon just mentioned. It's pretty, I actually had to scroll back up and read through, um, Topher's uh, insight there just to see there wasn't a single quote in there from Elder Holland and but it was crazy because how much of what was gone over in those student manuals and stuff is very closely what what went, went over in Elder Holland's talk um, and that members of the designer bus community did actually kind of mention right the and the one that Ammon mentioned as well that that the if you don't know what to pray for the, whole, the you pray for the Holy Ghost to, to tell you what to pray for. That's something that, uh, and, and the reference that was provided there, really good things. The other thing that Ammon mentioned here was the only other thing that I that I would mention, which is is how much honesty, once again, is a key to these things. And and how, like, maybe we don't realize um, it, is that the vain repetition is dishonest. And that's what people don't understand, is that it's an actual, it's actually a form of dishonesty. You know, and 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 people get mad at me for stuff like this, right? People get mad at me for pointing out stuff like this, but it's just like we have to get it out of us. We have to get it out of us, right? And in the in the Holland talk, uh, he said in there at the very very beginning, he said, "My wife was perfect," and and I said, you know, that's actually not correct. She wasn't perfect, right? We and 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 when when Ammon was talking, he said, "Well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, mate. How are you doing? Oh, good, mate. I'm doing good. You walk by, and it's like." I'm actually not. I'm actually going through a really, really hard time. But it's like you're being dishonest then. Like it's dishonest, right? And you would say, Well, I'm just I just don't want to be a Debbie Downer. And he, you know, Elder Holland was just trying to say something nice about his wife. And it's like, it doesn't matter. It's a lie. It's not truth. And when you you really want to get in with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost can't testify. It doesn't work with half truths. It just doesn't. It it it, it only works with complete one hundred percent truth, which is why when missionaries are teaching, you can have a missionary that's struggling, really struggling, and saying things that aren't quite accurate and so forth, and then all of a sudden they can just say, "I know that the Book of Mormon's true," or "The Book of Mormon is the Word of God," and all of a sudden. Bam! Hey, the Holy Ghost is there all, all of a sudden out of nowhere, and it's like, well, what caused that? It's because that was the first pure, truthful thing said in the last five minutes. That that's why, right? And and um, we need to not, we need to stop think, acting like being dishonest to God in our prayers or to each other is, is somehow a service, right? Men, when we're talking to each other and, and we go, how you doing? I'm doing good. And, and we're being dishonest with each other. How much that is a disservice to other people. You know, maybe I, I'm having trouble with my my lawn or something, right? Like something going on with that. And I just decide not to say anything. But the Lord put this individual in my path who also is going through a similar thing. And if you had just opened your mouth, the Lord could have worked a miracle there. But you were dishonest. Right. And and how much more you would have gained if you would have just been honest. Right. Same thing when when yeah. when when we try to say flattering things about our spouses or whatever that just aren't true. How much more powerful they were if they if we were just true, if we just spoke mm -hmm. the truth. Right. If, if we said, you know what, Micah 
or Am and her Tofa, they were perfect husbands. It's like, you know, that just wouldn't mean much. It, it just, it's a lie. We know it's a lie. But if your spouse said, you know what, Micah, Am and Tofa, they're not perfect. They make a lot of mistakes. But man, I wouldn't trade them for anything. That means a man would love to hear that. That infinitely has more value. And, and we need to understand that it's the same way with God. You know, what you saying, real conversational things to him have infinitely more value to him than your dishonesty and your vain repetition. So... Saying any one of us three is perfect would really have no value. <laughs> oh, it's so true. And actually, the past couple of weeks, what, when I've been talking to friends and they've been asking me how I'm doing and I'm able to say, I'm having a really rough time with work, was so refreshing because they'd be like, oh, man, I've had a, I've had a similar situation. Oh, I know exactly how you feel. Yeah, no, that's horrible. Uh, you know, I'm sure you'll be fine. I'm sure this, I'm sure that. And we have a, a real proper discussion. Whereas I could have, I'm not usually one to want to open up, but I was honest. And I think it deepened connections with a lot of people because that they realized that I could be open with them about how I'm doing and what's going on. And, and everyone yeah. can bond over issues at work. <laughs> yeah. What do they call it? They call it. Uh, trauma bonding <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah tra we're all trauma bonding so but you can do that but if you're not honest yeah. and let people in even a little bit you you could miss the angel that the lord has sent that day for you to be the one to give you what you needed to hear and boy have i been the recipient of those angels where if i didn't take the call or i didn't say something or whatever I would have missed that angelic assistance. So you're hundred percent right. I can think about exact moments. Yeah. Awesome. Is that it? Moving on, moving on down. Okay. Evans inside number one. Enos chapter one, and I say it the American way is it's easier. Oh my goodness. By the way, it's the Joseph Smith way. So just it's, it, it's it, tr there is no American pronunciation by Micah. If I'm pronouncing it a certain way, it's because Joseph Smith pronounced it that way first. So do you know Joseph Smith provides pronunciation guides in the Book of Mormon? Yeah, I, that's why we pronounce I, it the I way that I, we do. Yeah, I think you've heard the names. That. Oh, well, there you go. So, uh, yeah. So not an American. So they were first uh, Joseph Smith. So that's how he had him pronounced to him. So Joseph Smith, the American, having a crack at really strange names. <laughs> yeah. So there it is. So anyway, it's not Nephi. It is Nephi. Well, I'm happy. If he's happy, I'm happy. Right. So it is Zenus. Enos and Zenus, if you will. All right. Enos chapter one. And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie. This is the same thing that Mike went over. We're going to just really going to smash this home. Wherefore, my guilt was swept away. In the student manual, it says, do I read it? I'll just read this cool. bit. Faith in God's absolute and perfect truthfulness was a key to Enos's acceptance of the remission of his sins. Okay? He needed to have that absolute faith in God. Then it goes on to say that without the idea of the existence of this attribute, that is that God can't lie and that he's full of truth, the mind of man could have nothing upon which it could rest with certainty or would be confusion and doubt. The mind is enabled to lay hold. Oh, and then it goes on to say that, but with the idea of the existence of this attribute in the deity in mind, all the teachings, instructions, promises, and blessings become realities and the mind is unable to lay hold of them with certainty and confidence. So my question here is, what would have happened if in this moment, when Enos heard the voice of the Lord saying, Enos, your sins are forgiven you, what would it have happened if Enos didn't trust God and didn't believe in his word? 
Well, the story would have ended there. The story of Enos, well, game over, all over, close the book. His guilt would have remained. He wouldn't have been able to relinquish his guilt because he wouldn't have believed that God had the ability to forgive. He would have continued on wandering around the forest, missed out on having his faith becoming unshaken. And he wouldn't have even recorded this down on the brass plates or the plates at all. And then we wouldn't have had this miraculous event to look back upon and learn from and also develop our own faith in Jesus Christ. So how can we come to know God and believe in his word? Elder Robert D. Hales said, when we want to speak to God, we pray. And when we want him to speak to us, we search the scriptures. So brothers and sisters, what are the scriptures? Well, they're the word of God established and written by his prophets. DNC 138, what I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. So this means that if we don't have the same level of trust in the words of prophets being fulfilled in the scriptures, as we do in our own prayers being answered, God, then we don't actually trust God. And if we don't actually trust God, we can't lay hold on his promises or blessings with any confidence. They're just going to be slippery. We're not going to be able to hold on to them. All would be confusion and doubt, as taught by the prophet Joseph Smith. In the student manual for the Old Testament, it says the Lord honored Samuel as he honors all of his apostles. Uh, you need not you need, you need have no fear that when one of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ delivers a prophecy in the name of Jesus Christ because he is inspired to do that that it will fall by the wayside i know of more than one prophecy which looking at it naturally seemed as though it would fall to the ground as year after year passed but lo and behold in the providences of the lord that prophecy was fulfilled Ether chapter 4, come unto me, O ye Gentiles, and I will show unto you the greater things, the knowledge which has been hid up because of unbelief. Come unto me, O ye house of Israel, and it shall be made manifest unto you how great things the Father hath laid up for you from the foundation of the world, and it hath not come unto you because of unbelief. Behold, when you shall rend the veil of unbelief that doth cause you to remain in your awful state of wickedness and hardness of heart and blindness of mind, then shall the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundation of the world from you. Yea, when you shall call upon the Father in my name with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then shall ye know that the Father hath remembered the covenant which he made unto your fathers, O house of Israel. And then shall my revelations, which I have caused to be written by my servant John, be unfolded in the eyes of all the people. Remember, when you, sh when you see these things, you shall know that the time is at hand, that they shall be made manifest in very deed. And what was the covenant that the Lord made unto our fathers that John wrote about and that Nephi saw in vision? Third Nephi 20:22. 20, and behold, this people will I establish in this land unto the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob, and it shall be a new Jerusalem. And the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people. Yea, even I will be in the midst of you. Brothers and sisters, I have faith that in Jesus Christ, all of the promises and blessings made unto me personally, and also to all of the covenant house of Israel will be fulfilled. Amen. Nice. Um, just got two things I want to add to this. So, firstly, isn't it interesting that going back to Enos and his remission of sins, isn't it interesting that our remission of sins is linked intrinsically to our faith in God's ability to forgive the sin? Like, isn't it, isn't it like interesting? Like, 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 so Enos, there. Your to your first question. What would happen if, if Enos didn't believe that God had the ability to forgive his sins? That was the question, I think, wasn't it? Um, yep. If he didn't believe in, in yeah. his... If he didn't believe God, yeah, what would happen? Yeah. So 
and I, and I think you're right. I think he wouldn't have had his sins forgiven, but I don't think God would have possibly even even offered that forgiveness of sins, knowing that Enos didn't believe in him in the first place, right? There's that lack of faith in his ability to forgive sin or his um, lack of faith in the consistency of God um, that would just not allow God to forgive his sin. He just doesn't have the faith required, right? So it's, it's just it's, it's, it's a very interesting catch-22 that we have, that we have to have the faith in God who has the power to forgive sin for the sin to be forgiven. And, you know, very, very interesting. Um, and then I also wanted to say, um, uh, what was that based off? Um, oh, the, the thing that you read from Samuel, um, I don't know what, what it's, it's from the church manual there though. Um, and um, talking about prophecies, prophecies being fulfilled. And um, I don't know who this is, Grant. I'm not sure who that is, but that's that's what this has come from. Grant, Gospel Standards, must be a book. Um, and he says, I know of more than one prophecy which looking at it naturally seemed as though it would fall to the ground as year after year passed. But lo and behold, in the providences of the Lord, that prophecy was fulfilled. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen, like, how many prophecies Joseph made and how many are fulfilled. Like, like all, you know, like the amount of prophecies that Joseph himself made that all came to pass, right? And I guess my point here is how many prophecies lay in futurity for us, uh, which are to be, which might seem crazy, which might seem outlandish and insane, and like how can that possibly be? But we know that between now and the time the Lord returns, that we're going to see um, the greatest miracles ever manifest, um, and that the Lord will make bare His His holy arm, and uh, so, you know, just some of the mightiest miracles that will ever have been will come to pass, and so. Um, yeah, uh, even though prophecies can seem imp improbable or impossible, uh, lo and behold, in the providences of the Lord, those prophecies will be fulfilled. And I have faith in that, and I am excited by that. And um, just to your last point, I also um, have faith in Jesus Christ and those, those prophecies and those promises and the establishment of Zion, surely, soon to come. And look forward to it. You know all the those uh, all those true prophecies of Joseph Smith, and they talk about the failed prophecies of Joseph Smith. You know all the failed prophecies of Joseph Smith. Literally, if you go to them, all center around Jackson County. Every yeah. one of them, in one way, shape, or form, center around either Jackson County or a point of reference which comes after the redemption of Zion and building of New Jerusalem. So they all center around that one thing. So the question is, do we have that faith as a brother of Jared, which I love how, it, like in my point, I focused more on just what do we need to have in order to have faith, brother Jared. The Ammon's point was, what is the most important aspect of the faith of brother Jared that we should be living today? And it's Jackson County. It, it's the thing in the future that we know that if God did it in the past, that he'll do it in the future, right? So what do we do? What do we teach? Do we teach, well, Joseph wasn't perfect, so those failed prophecies around Jackson County are just his failures? Or do we teach, well, God changes, right? Well, if you do any of those things, then you not only are destroying the core attributes of God, you're also showing that you don't have faith as a brother of Jared. You don't actually believe those things. And, and so uh, it, it, it's a perfect tie-in to all those things. And the other thing that I would like to say, or I have to say now, is I looked up the pronunciation thing because I knew somebody was. So I, I looked this up real quick. So it's a little correction. This is a little bit like apparently the lectures on faith where we've now backtracked on this. So I'll just say that I was wrong. Okay. Uh, apparently there is in the back of the Book of Mormon, a pronunciation guide where they actually give you all the pronunciations of the names. But it says... These are suggestions for pronunciations in the Book of Mormon. And uh, if you go back to the beginning, right, Joseph Smith spelled out unfamiliar uh, names and would obviously use the names. So people heard it, but um, there wasn't uh, a formal enough, you know, acceptance of this, like the lectures on faith. We didn't all raise our hand and accept it, but, uh, you know, uh, Joseph Smith said the words, Brigham Young then said the words, and then 
John Taylor said it the way that he said it. And then we wrote our pronunciation guide based off of that. And now we don't accept it. So, so it's like the lectures on faith. There is a pronunciation guide in the back of Book of Mormon. I'm just trying to use that, but apparently it doesn't mean anything anymore. So who knows? Maybe it is Nephi. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so, please don't send me, please don't send me emails. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get all the emails about uh, how the lectures on faith weren't actually written mm -hmm. by Joseph Smith and how uh, it's actually pronounced Nephi. So, but send all of those to C. Wilkes. Uh, <laughs> three, five, one, one, niner. <laughs> send all that, that direction. So really, really good point. And I, and, and I would just add my testimony as well, that I, I, I believe these things and I don't care, you know, and maybe it's one of the blessings that God uh, blessed me with. I, I think that maybe God blessed Ammon and Topher with a little bit as well, you know, to just not give a darn, but uh, <laughs> what is it like to just not give a darn, but it's like, I just don't care. I don't care how crazy it makes me look. I, ju I just don't. I believe I read these things and I go, I believe that like I, I, something in me says, I know that that's true. And I've seen that pillar of fire. I know that. And uh, I don't care if I'm the last man standing. I really don't. When the, you know, when, the, you know, the, the Lord says, this, you know, all these things will be fulfilled, you know. When I come, the only question is, when I come, will there be faith on the earth? Will there be anybody left who believes? That's the only real question. And uh, I really hope that there's going to be at least three brothers, two or three <laughs> brothers, that, uh, that'll that say, yeah, well, there's still at least three crazy sons left in Israel that, that yeah, still believe all these things. Still believe all these things. Mm-hmm. Nice. And that's what he's going to say. Noise. That's, that's nice. That's <laughs> I believe the correct biblical pronunciation yeah. is niece. Neos. <laughs> Neos. But we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure. <laughs> Who can know? What is what is really doctrine? Do we know? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay anyway okay so i'll go to my next insight i guess uh this one's a little more grounded a little more grounded than the pronunciation guide okay so here we go um from the student manual here once again from the church of jesus christ latter-day saints this one says the voice of the lord came into my mind and in the student manual teaches us here Revelation or inspiration comes in several ways, including thoughts, impressions, and feelings. President Boyd K. Packer, which in my opinion, this is just my opinion, thoughts, impressions, and feelings, going to, going to once again, what I love about the church so much is that they give you real functioning definitions. I really, I really think that if you actually pour into that about what's a thought what's an impression what's a feeling you're going to find that those are pretty much synonyms okay um if, if people were to actually break down what what that actually means in layman's practical religion terms you're going to find that th these things are all talking about the exact same thing okay so president boyke packer the president of the corporate apostles discussed how we can recognize the voice of the lord Answers to prayers come in a quiet way. The scriptures describe that voice of inspiration as a still small voice. I've come to know that inspiration comes more as a feeling than a sound. Um, so once again, auditory versus in the mind, right? But once again, feeling, it's not, it, it's still something, it's a voice in here. Put differently, uh, put difficult questions in the back of your minds and go about your life. Ponder and pray quietly and persistently about them. The answer may not come as a lightning bolt. It may come as a little inspiration here and a little there, line upon line, precept upon precept. There's another word, inspiration, right? 
Um, once again, break these words down. You'll find them very, 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 they're synonyms. Some answers will come from reading the scriptures, some from hearing speakers, and occasionally when it is important, some will come by a very direct and powerful inspiration. Promptings will be clear and unmistakable. Prophet Joseph Smith shared this, this explanation of how the Lord communicates with us. A person may profit by noticing the first intimation of the spirit of revelation. For instance, when you feel, and listen once again, how Joseph Smith explained it, I love this man. It's as simple and clear as possible. Not all these synonyms so that you can go, does it mean this? Does it mean this? What is he trying to say here? Listen to this. You have no way of confusing when the prophet Joseph Smith teaches. He says, when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you that's a perfect way of describing it perfect it may give you sudden strokes of ideas so that by noticing it you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon i.e those things that were presented unto your mind by the spirit of god will come to pass and thus by learning the spirit of god and understanding it you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. Okay, and here are my words is uh, uh, wrapping up this thought here. The older I get, the more amazed I am at realizing just how little the saints of God understand personal revelation, or for that matter, the entirety of the, the pyramid of truth or rites of revelation, etc. These these core doctrinal understanding and I've been personally accused of recently of being a visionary man or a dreamer like Lehi was in the Book of Mormon. And yes, by those who claim to be my family, even what's sad, however, is that I'm in fact not a dreamer or a visionary man. I, I, do, I'm, I don't have dreams. I don't I don't have visions. I'm not that person. But for those who fail to grasp uh, the rights of revelation, the simplicity of revelation, and they never grow into the principle of revelation themselves. Well, then simply having the voice of the Lord come unto one's mind, that seems like a wild vision of sorts to, to, to the two other individuals, right? Now, I want this point to be as short as possible so I won't get into the meat of the pyramid of truth or the rights of revelation, but I encourage everyone within the sound of my voice to learn those things because those are prerequisites to really becoming this uh, principle of uh, of revelation unto oneself. What I do however wish to do is simply bear my testimony on this subject. I have heard the voice of the Lord in my mind. Thoughts put into my head in which I know I have not put them in there myself. As I have worked within the framework of the Lord, I have grown into the principle of revelation. I know his voice. And once again, let me bear witness that 99% of the time, the question I asked was some variation of, Lord, what do you want me to personally know or do? And 99% of the time, the answer was to me personally. And 99% of the time, when I acted on those promptings, I have found them fulfilled the same day or soon. And working with my first insight, I know that God doesn't change. I know that he does not lie, and I know he is no respecter of persons. So I know if it works for me, I know it will work for you. I know it. And I know that the time is coming when those who have not learned to have faith as the brother of Jared, and those who have not learned to be a principle of revelation, and those who have not paid the price for faith as a principle of power and or priesthood power will be cut off and swept from the land. Eventually, time is up. If you feel like you just can't believe it will work for you, or as uh, Topher used that example of the atonements for everyone else, I just can't believe it for me. I personally plead with you to have faith and try again. Ask the right questions with a sincere heart, real intent, and faith in Christ, and act on the promptings given, and I promise you, they will come. When we stop when we stop listening to the voice, be that through the scriptures, the Holy Ghost, or through the keys, etc., the voice will stop speaking. And brothers and sisters, we live in the days 
in which we simply cannot afford to be drowning in the concert of Babylon and have heaven remain silent in our behalf. Amen to that. Seriously. Um, that your, just your thoughts. I mean, the whole thing's great, but just your thoughts there at the end. Um, I think a lot of people will find that really beneficial, really helpful. I can't overstate how, how, I don't know. You see your simple testimony of like the way that revelation inspiration works for you. And I think a lot of people struggle with it. I know I personally struggle with it through my life. I'm not a visionary man either. And so often, you know, I don't know if Ammon's here or not, but, um, you know, Ammon's had many a dream and I've, I've never had anything pretty much. And so it's, 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 it's not hard to hear. It's, it's, um, you often sit there and go, you know, <laughs> what am I doing wrong here? Why do what, what, you know, what, what, why do I not have things like this? But your, your simple testimony here at the end here, I think is very, very helpful. Um, and I hope as many people as possible actually hear this and read this, because I think that's a really practical way. And again, talking about the faith of the faith of the brother of Jared in knowing that, uh, you know, things of the past and in the scriptures and, and things, you know, the, the unchangeability of God and the fact that what has happened for one can happen for another. If we put the same amount of faith and effort in and obedience, um, it, it gives, I think this will give great confidence and, and encouragement to people who might struggle with that. Thankfully, um, and again, I th I, and I'll be honest, I, I've, I've kind of not always struggled. I believe I, I receive inspiration and revelation um, again, as thoughts that come into my mind and as, um, you know, as pure intelligence or um, as impressions or feelings or, you know, thoughts, whatever. I believe I, I've been getting that my whole life. And I think that I am um, have always um, had an expectation of more. And that's probably part of my problem is that I've always expected that I might get something more. And so I've kind of overlooked the simple um, direction that the Lord has always given me. And um, so that's, I think, something that I've, I've um, had to learn. Uh, is that uh, my expectation has been probably too too insane. And I think I've had to tone back my expectation, but realize that the Lord's always actually been guiding me. Um, and I've had a lot of experiences with that really recently with all my house stuff and, and how that all came about really, really quickly and things. Um, and and again, I've said this before, but just every week we're doing this come follow me stuff. And every week um, uh, these thoughts, impressions and feelings and, and, and things come in. As I read through the come follow me um you know, our document and it's got the scriptures, it's got everything. It's just really, really interesting every week to me what starts, you know, you start reading and then all of a sudden something goes, oh, this is a thing that you need to, you know, and it's, it's honestly, it's always random too. It's always something I wouldn't even, not always, sometimes it's something I want to, I, I like, but uh, oftentimes it's something I wouldn't expect that that would be my thing that I need to be focusing on right now. Um, but, and then it just starts rolling off and I'll just start typing on my computer and I'll have my, you know, my, and you can see my insights are often very simple. There's a bit of scripture, a bit of a, um, a bit of the manual and then my thoughts about it. And those thoughts just come rolling out and it's, um, it's just, it's almost fun. Uh, it's, it's really, really nice to just, I don't know, you have these, these sorts of things just, just, just roll through. But anyway, I, I really love what you just said here. I think it's really, really practical and I hope as many people as possible hear that, especially those who might struggle with that sort of thing. Um, um, I did write something down here. What did I have? Um, oh, I, I guess back back to the thing that you read from the, the the church manual there, and it was from Boy K. Packer. And again, his his advice also is pretty practical. You know, put difficult questions in the back of your mind and go about your lives, um, and you know, and ponder and pray quietly and persistently about them. And it's like you know if we have these things in our minds and we're living the way we should live as righteous saints, it's almost like inevitable that they will resolve them. You know, like it'll come, it'll be something that happens to us. It'll be something that someone says to us. It'll be something in the scriptures. It'll be something if we're living righteously, these things will inevitably roll themselves out. You know, the other option back to my first insight is mighty prayer, <laughs> mighty, mighty prayer. And, um, but, but inevitably if we live in the right way, it's very practical. It's these things will come, will come out if we're doing the right thing. Um, and as, uh, where, where did it say it? Um, or it might've been something that you said, but you, I can't remember where I, where I got this from, but I wrote down, it's, it's something that we need to learn and grow into, you know, the, 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 um, the ability to, to gain or, you know, revelation as a, as a principle is something that we need to learn and grow into. And again, it just comes by experience and persistence and, um, righteousness anyway.
really love really really love this and i think it's very very practical and um yeah i, ho I hope as many people as possible hear this I get down and dirty on this a little bit. I wonder if people, I wonder if people hear about the spiritual experiences that other people are having, visions, dreams, sudden bursts of inspiration, pure intelligence smacking them over the head. I wonder if people hear about those experiences and then say to themselves, "This is to your point, Chris. Why don't I have those experiences, whilst at the same time?" doing absolutely nothing to develop their, their own ability into the gift of revelation. So it's, I mean, it's really easy to point at someone and say, why does that guy have a nice car? And then walk back to their, their house and refuse to get a job that can generate, <laughs> generate the money buying a car or, or something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's like, duh. Isn't it obvious why you can't have those experiences? It's because you're not developing anything to receive those experiences. And that's how the spirit of revelation works. But take take away some of this these things that seem miraculous for a second and just think about the, the principle of receiving intelligence, just pure intelligence through the Holy Ghost. I've had experiences and some of the most sacred experiences to me uh moments when pure intelligence has touched my mind and for example i've i've woken up in the early morning and it immediately has come to my mind something very sp spiritually special to me and i've written it down and as i've studied it and pondered it i've realized just how deep and important it is for me and and i've known that it's it's the spirit of revelation. It's from the Holy Ghost. It's pure intelligence. And it's been an incredible blessing to my life. But when, so my question is, do you out there, have you had those experiences? And if you say no, and you think it's unfair that I've had that experience and that you haven't, do you know what it took for me to get that? Honestly, do you know what it took for me to have just that one experience that I'm thinking of right now? Do you know what it took for me to have that? It took me weeks and weeks and weeks daily studying the subject, daily reading the scriptures on the subject, daily trying to find more information on the subject, daily praying about the subject. Father, can you please help me understand this? Give me some more knowledge. Help me understand. Help me unlock the mystery here. I'm not getting it. I need more. I, I want this information to benefit the lives of some other people. Please help me understand this. Pleading. And in my quiet time during the day, what are you thinking about? Making money? driving a car, going home and eating something cool. In those moments, I was thinking about this as well. And so in order to have that special experience that I deem very personally, foundationally um, important to me, I put everything into, into obtaining that intelligence from the Holy Ghost. And so, and this is not, this is not like, oh, look at me, I can brag. I'm just saying, man, what it takes for me to get a little intelligence out of the Holy Ghost is for me to do everything that I possibly can. And then the Holy Ghost will come in and give me that portion that I can't obtain from myself for myself. And it gives it to me in a way where I know it came from the Holy Ghost. I know it was pure intelligence straight from the Holy Ghost. So I think this is a, this is a wonderful point. I think the principle of growing into the gift of revelation is a is mis not only misunderstood but it's it's underused it's underutilized and i think if we utilized it people would be having experiences like the one that i've just shared and they would be so foundationally important to them that they would never forget it that they would always be able to turn around and go i have grown in my own way into the principle of revelation and i've had this moment or have had these moments that i cannot deny where the Holy Ghost has given me something I could not gain for myself. And you will know that it only came, not because the Lord just wants to smack you over the head with intelligence, but because you did so much in order to deserve it. And not deserve, you did so much to grow into it that the Lord gifted it to you and blessed you with it. To your point there, Amon, you know, like when you were awoken and you got this little burst of inspiration, imagine if you did nothing with it. 
You know what I mean? Like, like, cause even when you got that, you spent time up, you know, after that looking into a bunch of stuff. And I remember every day, you know, further looking into it and imagine if you didn't do anything with it, then that would have been the end. Mm-hmm. Well, know? well, would, and would you I ever get more? I guess the question that you raised there is, would I have received that if the Lord knew I would have done nothing with it? Mm, that's all. That's also true. Yeah. And right? I think, isn't that I think it, I have a perfect, perf, uh, perfect example to say that. Yeah, actually, there are cases where he tests to see you, you do it, um, and 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 he puts you on those hinge points. So I'll, I'll share one real quick. So on my mission, my my companion, my trainer, because I was new on my mission, so I had a trainer. He, he would decide where we we're going to go tracting, and then and then I, he would say, "Okay, now you get to decide where we go tracting." We tracked it every day from ten to ten to uh, ten to three in the afternoon. And I didn't know what to do. So I just got a map and I prayed over a map. No one told me how to do this. No one showed me how to do this. I just said, if I'm going to go knocking doors, I'm going to go where the Lord wants me to go. And I started that by myself early on a mission, did it my whole mission because of, of how effective, you know, that was on my mission. And just, I have a ton of miracles with that, but how did it start? Well, I'll tell you how it started. Um, in that we went out tracking me and my companion, he picked the spot and it was a nightmare. The, the area was a nightmare. It was a giant, weird cul-de-sac area. I would say cul-de-sac, but you're mostly thinking suburbs. It was a big circle of ro- row homes and it was terrible. The very next day we had an exchange as my district leader came into our area. And I, my district leader said, I've been told that you have this gift of praying over a map and it works out really well. I want to see how this works. So I prayed and I said, okay, this is where we need to go. And I felt extremely strong about this area. We showed up at the area and it was literally the same place that I had just tracked the day before with my other, with my trainer. And, and it was the same spot, but I didn't know because I was looking at a map and I don't know my left hand from my right hand in Philly. I don't know. And so we literally go to the same spot and I go, this can't be right. We have to go somewhere else. So can you receive revelation and not buy into it? Yes. Uh, I was early on in my mission. I was in a hinge point there and I didn't have the faith. I assumed I had screwed up. Thank God I had a district leader at the time that said, no, you need to trust this gift and we need to track the street again. And so we tracked the street again, and I'm telling you, it was even more hostile than the day before. But as we are approaching, and this is the cliche, as we are approaching the last house in the cul-de-sac, this man came out of the house, and he had his shirt off, and he looked a little rough, and he was holding a baby. And uh, and at first we thought, at first I thought, oh, this guy's going to come out, and he's going to really give us the give us the beat down. And then we saw, as we got closer, he was holding a baby, and that that helped us out a bit. We assumed, okay, he's probably not going to be us down. But anyway, we we go over there and say, hey, how you doing? And he said, so are you who, you know, God sent to me? And we're like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I was inside praying, and God said, go outside and sit on your porch. I've sent, I'm sending people to you right now. And uh, this individual had just gone through a, a major heart thing, had just gone through heart surgery, and um, totally changed his life. It was the process of changing his life. But yeah, completely ready. Him, his wife, and his two kids were baptized. And a complete miracle. And it was like, uh, could I have walked away from that? Oh, absolutely. If I didn't have the right spiritual mentor in my life at that time, that could have changed my the whole trajectory of my mission. But from that point on, I'll tell you what, I never, I never second-guessed it again. From that point on, he could have told me to track the same street five times in a row and I would have done it because of that experience. So <laughs> awesome. Well, I love your mission stories. They're great. Perfect addition. Really cool. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. Up. All right. Here's my next one. This is about the importance of keeping a record. So we've basically spent most of our time in Enos, but this is, I'm going into, now, how do you say this one? I say Omni. Do you guys say omni or some other weird? <laughs> I don't know. Omni. Uh, omni. 
Uh, so in Omni, Mosiah, he goes off and he discovers the people of Zarahemla. Um, so I'm just going to read a random verse from Omni, chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Omni, I believe. Verse 17. And at the time that Mosiah discovered them, this being the people of Zarahemla, they had become exceedingly numerous. Nevertheless, they had had many wars and serious contentions and had fallen by the sword from time to time, and their language had been cut had become corrupted, and they had brought no records with them, and they denied the being of their creator. And Mosiah, nor the people of Mosiah, could understand them. So they're in quite a state. So now this is a interesting sort of I did not this is one of those ones I didn't expect to be really talking about, but let's see how we go here. So I just want to start with, isn't it amazing how quickly a civilization can not only dwindle in unbelief, but also have their language become corrupted? Because I think we're only talking about, you know, maybe a couple hundred years or not even. Uh, maybe uh, it'd be a couple hundred years, I guess, maybe 180 to 200 years or so, because they came out at a similar time to uh, Lehi and Nephi from Jerusalem. So we have, have the example of both the Lamanites and the Mulekites who became the people of Zarahemla, who completely lost their testimony and beliefs in a relatively short time span. I mean, it's relatively short. It's a, it's a couple generations long. Neither of them kept records, which is an interesting uh, kicker there. This is why it's so important to keep a record or a history or a journal, to maintain a record of truth, to preserve the precious dealings of man with God and to provide a way for posterity to learn and to ensure language and communication is maintained. Now we can see how critical it was for Nephi to get the plates from Laban, no matter what the cost. And the cost was quite great, really. Uh, when you when you know what was put on Nephi to gain those plates was quite a great cost. If we, you know, we'll think about it. Um, now here's where I'm going to get a little speculative, but hear me out. I personally like to believe that the Savior visited essentially, let's say, everyone. I say lots of civilizations after his resurrection because to me, why would he not have? Um, it makes sense that he would offer the same opportunity to all. And this again is speculative because I've got no, like I said, essentially proof of this. Um, well, there's things you can look at that sort of say it might be true. But anyway, one of the examples that I'll point to is the indigenous Australians. They've never had a written language. They just never have had a written language um, or a record. Um, and interestingly, the same as North American Indians. Um, never had a written language until the 1800s when they adopted um, writing when it was like sort of presented to them. Um, but the indigenous, indigenous Australians, they drew on rocks a lot. So they had pictures and they also um, communicated all of their stories by word of mouth. Um, and... And again, I don't want to yeah, I've got to be really careful. I don't want to offend anyone here because the other problem with word of mouth stories is that you get into a Chinese whispers scenario sometimes where things get embellished or diminished um, through the through that communication. Um, and if we were to look at the Mulekites as an example, um, they were quite confused by the time Mosiah found them. Um, anyway, so back to in, the indigenous Australians. They have a lot of drawings of a white glowing man uh, with white eyes, and they call they call these this 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 figure Wanjina, or sky beings or supreme beings. Um, but their explanation has only been handed down by word of mouth for hundreds or thousands, depending on how long you, you they have been around for, um, of years. So there's no real understanding as to what it is anymore. And they 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 do have explanations, but. Me, I personally believe, you look at that, I personally believe Christ visited these people and they recorded it the best way that they could, which was in drawing form. Um, but the truth was lost to the ages. And again, forgive me, this is speculative, right? But I, I, I can't help but think the Lord loves everyone and I don't see why he would have um, kept his, the resurre the, the res his resurrection, the knowledge, the knowledge of him as, as the saviour of the world to only two, uh, two civilizations on the massive, earth um anyway i've got a picture in this document of the the, the wanjana or the sky beings if anyone ever uh looks through this anyway so the church manual for this has a little thing about it's called three separate civilizations in the record in this short account we learn of three groups of people whom the lord brought to the land of promise in the western hemisphere the first group mentioned was lehi's colony 
the majority of the Book of Mormon relates their story and that of their descendants. The Book of Mormon also identifies a second group referred to as the people of Zarahemla, who were descendants of Mulek, who joined the Nephites. Excuse me. Mulek, a son of Zed King Zedekiah, left Jerusalem and traveled to the Americas after Babylon, destroyed Jerusalem around 587 BC. So that's like just after uh, Nephi and Lehi left, really. Um, 13 years or so. Uh, without a scriptural record, the people of Zarahemla were a living witness that the Spirit said, of what the Spirit said to Nephi, that a whole nation would dwindle in unbelief. The Mulekites then joined with the Nephites under the rule of King Mosiah. The third group was the Jaredites, who came to the land of promise following the time of the Great Tower, mentioned in Genesis 11. The original Jaredite colony grew into a great race. Eventually, however, they annihilated themselves in a great civil war sometime between 600 and 300 BC, leaving only Coriantuma, their last king, and Ether, a prophet of the Lord. Ether finished the record, and Coriantuma apparently wandered until he found the people of Zarahemla, where he lived for the space of nine moons before dying. Little is known of the Jaredites other than what is recorded by Moroni in the Book of Ether. So, here's my word. What causes generations to dwindle in unbelief? It starts with just one generation not being taught by their parents or not having a record to learn from or gain a testimony of the Saviour from. It takes one generation to, 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 screw, to screw that up. Um. And perhaps it's not that we don't teach our children, but that we just do a poor job teaching them or testifying to them or showing them our belief through our example, you know. And we actually talked a lot about this two weeks ago, and I'm just going to refer quickly back to an Elder Holland quote from two weeks ago. And you'll remember this. He said, live the gospel as conspicuously as you can. Keep the covenants your children know you have made. Give priesthood blessings and bear your testimony. Don't just assume your children will somehow get the drift of your beliefs on their own. And my final thoughts here, this is another sobering wake-up call to myself to make sure I spend enough time on my family and my example I set to them, as well as what I record down for my posterity to see. Ammon and I went to clean up a bunch of our dad's stuff that he has accumulated over the years. He's basically got a shed full of junk and uh, it has to be moved or we have to deal with it. So we, we went and started looking at it and what we're going to do about it. And I found a box in there that contained journals that he kept whilst serving as a bishop and in other callings. And to be honest, that's quite precious. When I found that, I was like, that's precious to me. It might not even be precious to him, but it's precious to me. So I'm going to make sure that we look after and keep those those records. Another thing, I'm going to keep looking through all this stuff and see what he's got in there. I'm grateful he kept that, that sort of journal. Um but we'll keep that so that his experiences and testimony can bolster his posterity. Um, and if we've talk, obviously talked about the importance of keeping our own journals and such as well. But we may be running out of time before the second coming, but let's make sure that we don't let our posterity dwindle in unbelief. Let's not let them assume we have a testimony or hope that they get the drift. That's it. Amen. Um. That uh, is crazy because that, once again, tying back into the talk breakdown that we did this last Sunday was also Elder Holland. And in Elder Holland's talk, he said that um, crisis coming back for the members of the church, but not the nominal members of the church. And nominal meant in name only, or you could almost say unrecognizable members of the church. When then here he says, live conspicuously, which conspicuously means easy to notice and obvious. So that th you could almost say it, conspicuously and nominal are opposites. And so here he is teaching the exact same thing again. So that's just awesome. I think it's interesting. Once again, we're talking about the lectures on faith and 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 so forth, and and these principles here. And the, now we're talking about the written word in the journal. It, how how uh. Faith is a principle of power and it's exercised or brought into being by word. So, you know, when the Lord says, said, speak unto that mountain and depart and it shall move, right? It's always based off of speaking and, and people don't, uh, maybe haven't really thought about that. So when, when the, the Lord created or organized the universe, he spake and it happened. So it was like, move over here, do this, do this. And the particles responded to him actually speaking. 
And I think it's fascinating how the connection between the written language as the ability to speak, where it's like if you don't if you don't know how to read and write in a language, you, you don't maintain the ability to speak in the language. This the language then becomes mutated. And then if the language becomes mutated, well, then you can't exercise faith as a principle of power because you, what are you even saying, right? Like you don't even know. Mm. You you have to you have to know, right? And so I, I think that's fascinating. And what I think also is fascinating is, is that when you go back and you look at the, the history uh, of the, the world, there's a couple things that, that really – shock people they don't understand like where they come from right like the evolutionists right and one of them is actually the written language right we have certain certain cultures like the one you're describing that don't have any written language but what they don't what they can't understand is where the written language came from because it was one of the things that just exploded onto the scene all at once all together all of a sudden here's the written language not like, you know what, maybe we should have this symbol and this symbol like you would think it would. And then it would just kind of expand from there. So like over 20 years or 100 years or 20 years, you would just kind of add to this language over time. No, just all of a sudden I know where there's language everywhere. The word just exists. Another one of those that really is is surprised people is seeds, which, you know, I think is interesting. And and comparing it to this, is that once again you go back in the 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 record, you think, okay, well maybe there was something that resembled a seed, and then it kind of grew into something else. Nope, it's like you look in one fossil record, there's zero seeds, and then you look in the very next group, and all the seeds are just there. They just exist, and their seeds are one of those things that we have no idea how they work. Like how how did we get from this to this, and uh, why why even bring that up? Because I think it's interesting, once again, that we're talking about faith and we're talking about recording written languages and so forth. And what is it most often referred to as? A seed. Planting the seed. And so I think it's it's fascinating that, once again, um, how the word is so often compared to the seed and how they they, they react the same way. They, they Historically, they fall in the same way, right? And if we don't... Uh, if we don't write these things, and like you described with your dad, if we don't write these things down, then these seeds that could potentially fall off of the tree to future generations to increase faith never happen. It, it never happens. But because your your father wrote those journals, maybe those seeds from his tree, the father tree, will fall down, and maybe they'll plant in the hearts of, of his children or his grandchildren, and uh, it'll produce fruit, you know? I think mm. I think it's an awesome thing. That's a cool way of putting it. Yeah. Ancient civilizations and their contact with the savior or their contact with truth and understanding from him have always been of interest to me. And you'll see that most cultures somewhere you might need to go fairly far back, but at some somewhere along the line there is there is evidence of them having had visitations or them having had knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ of God the Father and of of other certain eternal truths and some of that I've shared on here before I was talking about ancient China when the Savior Jesus Christ died and was and there was calamity globally that occurred um, the emperor of China at the time wrote down that the God of heaven has passed away and he granted like a week of mourning for all the people in, in all the land of ancient China to mourn the God of heaven passing away. And so then you would question yourself, well, how did he know about that? You know, how does one come, come across that information? And then you could... Um, I guess you could speculate on that, but that is a fact. That's in in the written. So you're talking about having some kind of written down uh, history in order to reflect on those things, so we know where truth comes from. So it's nice that there are some snippets of those things, even from ancient times. So in ancient China, there are some mentions, and then also in ancient China, you you even look at their temples, their temple structures, how they're built what happens inside their temples there's three layers 
There are sending layers. There's washing and anointings outside the temple for the priests, those that are that are worthy, washing and anointings entering the temple. In the third section, there's the Holy of Holies, and there's certain things like incense burning and genealogy that is specifically around the, the inner sanctum, all their genealogy and their family names and their family ties, all that sort of stuff. Now, you can see that it's fallen into apostasy. You can see the apostasy when you visit those temples. But what's really interesting to me is that the older Chinese temple I ever visited, like the older they got, the ones that I visited, seemingly the, the closer that they were to what we would refer to as, as a modern day temple or more similar in their aspects. And I think it's just, that's just the apostasy made manifest. At some point, they've had something so true and so close to the truth that you could almost, you know, slap the Lord's name on it if they were righteous people and, um, and have it consecrated, you know, consecrated unto the Lord and then start practicing in it. But I think that there are evidences of those around the world, and I'm grateful that we can still see some of that. In your example, we can still see it in ancient Chinese culture. We can still see it in ancient North American native, you know, native cultures and potentially South American. And we can see it in the Holy Land and, and roundabouts. We can see it all over the place. So it's I'm always very, very grateful that there, there is evidences of those things because I find them fascinating and I feel like it helps build the narrative for me. Remember, Keeping in mind, you guys know very well that I'm extremely visual. So helping me visualize some of these things helps me in the process of understanding. It's not where my it's not where my testimony comes from, and it's not what my testimony hangs up, hangs from, but it does help me visualize and helps me conceptualize and put the puzzle pieces together. And what it does tell me is that God is no respecter of persons. And at some point, if the opportunity was available to to those people through their own righteousness or their own desires or the Lord's timing or whatever it might be, why would he not manifest himself unto those people? He would. He simply would. That's that's the testimony that I have. He's no respecter of persons. He loves all of them the same. Other sheep he has and those other sheep he will also visit, succor, tend to, provide knowledge to. So fascinating stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right, Evan, you got the last one. Okay. This is a good one. And not just because of the um the visual cues <laughs> contained therein. It's uh <laughs> no, I can't really remember what this one is. All right, let's do this. Ammon's Insight number two, brothers. From the student manual, it says, Speaking with sharpness. Church leaders must speak out at times with directness and sharpness in warning members of the church of anything that may jeopardize their salvation. President Spencer W. Kimball referred to this obligation as he spoke to young adults. He said, I am sure that Peter and James and Paul found it unpleasant business to constantly be calling people to repentance and warning them of dangers. But they continued unflinchingly. So we, your leaders, must be everlasting at, lastingly at it. If, if young people do not understand, then the fault may be partly ours. But if we make the true way clear to you, then we are blameless. Close quote. Now, this, uh, this was cool because as I read through that this week, again, these little alarm bells go off in my brain and they go, Micah just talked about this in his breakdown of Jeffrey R. Holland's talk, where he was talking about the importance and the role of watchmen. And I don't want to read too much of this, but it's very, very good. It's very good. In Ezekiel chapter 33, speaking about what a watchman does, I'll give you some of it. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring this bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he bloweth, blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, 
his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, son, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Boy, that is just the best possible example of, of the importance of being a watchman and also the danger of being a watchman. So there's the blessings and the cursings, <laughs> which we sometimes like to talk about. There are blessings and cursings. Don't get it wrong. It's not that you do the right thing and you get the blessings. You do nothing and nothing happens. If you do the right thing, you receive the blessings. And if you do nothing, when you're supposed to do something, something bad happens. It, it's not that nothing happens. Because of your omission, something bad actually happens. And in the case of being a watchman, the Lord has got you up there to say that if a guy is coming at, at this city, if you don't warn the city and they die, their blood is on your hands because you were supposed to watch. But if you do warn them and they don't prepare for whatever reason, they can't be bothered or they don't believe you or whatever it might be, and the man with the sword comes into that city and kills them, at least you're clean. You said something. You, would, you did what the watchman was supposed to do. Was it popular? Maybe not. Spoken in a tone that they were happy with? Maybe it wasn't. But at least you did what the Lord needed you to do. The Lord of that city, the Lord of Zion, the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of the vineyard. Whatever he needed you to do, you did it. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught, The poor reveres in our lives may have voices too shrill, use bad grammar, ride a poor horse, and may pick the oddest hours to warn us. But the test of their warnings is not the, is their accuracy, not their diplomacy. The disciples' commitment to truth must be to truth without an inordinate concern for the method of delivery. So it doesn't... Try not to worry, brothers and sisters, try not to worry about too much about how people are going to take what you're, take what you're sharing if you're doing so in love. You're, you're trying to warn people. We're here to... We're here to shout repentance, right? That's what the Doctrine and Covenants screams at us. The entire Doctrine and Covenants speak nothing but repentance unto this generation. And open your mouth and it will be filled. The Lord's going to tell you what you need to say. And people might not like to hear it. Most people don't like being told that they need to change. It's not, it's not nice, especially if you do it in a voice that they don't like, especially if you use a grammar that they don't appreciate, especially if you're, you're coming on a poor horse. You know, for example, in the modern era, you're lesser than them in society. So what do you have to, to tell them about anything? You know, the way that people look on you because of your, your, your wealth or the lack thereof. Try not to be too worried, brothers and sisters, about the delivery. Be more worried about whether or not you delivered. And I'll say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, amen. amen. Even if you come in riding your horse named Enos... Enos. <laughs> Enos. Deliver that message. You know, I thought of when you um, were through this, I thought of once again, sins of omission versus sins of comm commission. Like, like, once again, we, we like to pretend like well, you just said there, well, if I do the good thing, I get the blessing, but I don't do anything, nothing happens. And it's like, no, we actually get punished for doing nothing. And, and, and I think some people like like to believe like, well, it's there's a difference. Like if if I'm on the watchtower and I'm supposed to raise the alarm, right? And I don't, well, that doesn't mean that I'm not responsible for anybody dying. Like I'm not the one killing them, right? That's different than like if I was got off my watchtower and started killing people as well. But you go, well, according to the Lord, not really, because in one way, shape, or form, you're responsible for those people's deaths. And we get into, once again, the sins of omission versus commission, where we, we like to believe that, like, doing something is far, far worse. So if you tried to warn somebody, but you did it a little bit the wrong way, use the wrong term, oh, man, that's a that's a terrible, terrible sin. But not saying anything, that that's just not that big a deal. But it's like, you know, that's not the way it works in common law 
and for most serious laws anywhere in the world. An accessory to murder in common law carries exactly the same penalty as the actual crime. And the and in most places in the world, accessory to murder or some more serious things versus common law will carry severe crimes or, or penalties or just as severe as doing it. So if you saw your somebody you know with a gun, like once again, the watcher on the tower, and you did nothing, and you allowed that person to go in the home and kill people, you're an accessory. You're an accessory, and you're just as responsible um, you know, as, as the person who went in there and, and did these things. And so I, I think that um, I think once again, it comes down to how we like to we like to break things into boxes, not for understanding, but purely as a way to self-justify us not doing anything like we yeah. do it with spiritual blessing or spiritual things and temporal things. Well, so long as I just go to the temple and, and have a temple recommend, then I don't have to learn how to stand independent of all creatures like there's spiritual things and then there's temporal things. Why did you just separate that? You only separate it because you're not doing the temporal. The people that are doing the temporal aren't doing that separating. The only reason why you separate it is because you're not doing the temporal and you don't think it's important, so you separated it so that you could devalue it. You know, the, the people that are on the watchtower, the, the what was it, Paul Revere, what was the example that he used there? That's, that's such a great quote. Was it Paul Revere? Yeah, the Paul Revere's, right? The people that are up there that are like, yo, whoa, the enemy's coming, right? They're not out there saying, you know, justifying not saying anything. They're not out there saying, well, you know, because they're doing it, right? The sins of omission versus commission. So, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a, a great thing that we need to remember. And I, last thing I'll say here, that w the church has actually gone one direction on this and has now gone completely the other direction on this. So, the, and this is something that's happened really, really recently. So it's kind of, kind of cool where. We, the church was like this, where they would spell things out for you because they didn't want to be held accountable for you. So they would say, this is wrong. Don't do this, right? Like made it really clear. And then all of a sudden the, for the strength of youth and our, our, uh, our, how we're supposed to wear our, our temple garments was very vague. It was very, go to the Lord and try to figure this stuff out on your own. And you know what they, I think they, they discovered is that once again, going to one of my points, People aren't very good at this whole personal revelation thing. They just use it as an excuse to just do as much evil as possible. So now they're going back to uh, they they've totally changed the uh, the uh, crites or the uh, description on on how you're supposed to wear your garments. And once again, it's now more intense than it's ever been. And so uh, it, it, they've gone back to to this mentality where it's like. No, we're, we're, we'd rather just make it clear and at least the blood's not on us anymore. And so, so if you're not familiar with that, check out check out the how the temple garment, uh, the, the change. We've talked a little bit on Discord and showed the before and after. Man, it is... Uh... Yep. It was interesting point that you made on... Oh, sorry, real quick, Chris. Real interesting right. point that you made on the law, how the law sees that as well. In Australia, I'm not sure if this is the same in America, but in Australia, we have something called the Good Samaritan Act. And basically what that is, is because the law expects that people without any medical knowledge or ability are still going, are still expected to go and help somebody that's injured in the street. So if someone gets hit by a car or a baby gets electrocuted in the street or some, you know, a kid falls off his bike and he's, he's bleeding the law wants to encourage and expect people to just do good things to other people, despite the fact that they have no idea what they're doing. And so, and they wanted to protect that and enshrine that in law so that people can't turn around and say, oh, that guy didn't have any medical, medical assistance. So when he was trying to save my son, he probably exacerbated the problem to the point where, um, you know, I'm going to claim compensation from them or whatever. The, the law has come along and said, no. We expect, like, this is a basic, this is a basic thing to understand. We expect people to help one another when they're in trouble, and despite the fact that they don't really know what they're doing. So, as clumsy as a person is, 
the law still expects you to get off your, off your butt and help somebody in need. And then that's also been placed onto the majority of insurance policies in Australia so that insurers will also back that under their policies that if you if one of the people insured by your policy goes and does a good Samaritan Act and anything comes from that, they will also make sure that they pay any costs or fees or anything in relation to to, to that person trying to save another or assist another. Because it's it's one of those basic things it's not hard to understand and you don't have to be good at what you do in order to do something and the same thing goes with the gospel you don't have to be good at sharing the gospel in order to share it you don't have to have good grammar you don't have to good have good pronunciation you don't have to have a good spoken voice you don't have to be anything you don't have to have a nice car horse chariot whatever you just do it try not to worry about too much the delivery just just do it you know, you your work. One of the things, great things about it is the Lord will assist you with your delivery as you work on that process as well. So, sorry, Chris, go for it. That's right. I've forgotten my point. Led off the back of Marcus' point, but I can't remember what the last thing he said was now. <laughs> um, but I remember what I was kind of going to say is that um, imagine how I was talking about the, the last thing you said. The garments. That's right. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, um, right, and, ch and the church policy becoming more strict again. That's right. So, um, you imagine you imagine the responsibility and the burden that the prophet, like the presidency of the church, the apostles must feel as true one hundred percent watchmen. Right, like they are by definition the absolute watchmen. Right on the tower. You know, um, that's the analogy we always use for prophets. Right, the prophet's up on that tower. He's the guy that can see, and he, he gives us the information. Just imagine the responsibility they must feel upon their heads. And it reminds me of Jacob. Like we're talking about, you know, Jacob um, a couple of weeks ago or one or two weeks ago, where he was trying to rid his garments of the blood of his generation by making sure they were very, very aware of what they were doing. And I just imagine the president of the church and the and the apostles and everyone speaking to him at a conference, how much of an actual, and again, I don't know if it's a burden, but how much of a responsibility, let's say, they must feel upon themselves to make it very, very clear what we what we should be doing, and you can see that in the quote from um, was it Boy Kate or oh, Spencer W. Kimball? Um, Spencer W. Kimball um, about uh, you know it's it's unpleasant, right? It's unpleasant to to make these things known, um, but we must make them known unflinchingly, right? Like we must you know blow that trumpet un unflinchingly, and I tell you what that. Um, that Ezekiel section that Ammon read, that is like almost like perfect parable for the whole thing. Hey? It's like just a really, really simple, easy way to understand the the whole the whole thing. Really simple. Um and I was gonna say um so to be a watchman, right? If you, and, and what 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 are we trying to be? We, we all want to we all need to be watchmen on the wall, right? We all need to be watchmen on the wall. That's you know, um part of our, our duty and our responsibility is something that we need we need to do um to I forget the verbiage, but in, in relation to Zion, we need to be watching on the wall, right? To to sort of help it come to fruition, to be there, you know, whatever. Um and but to be a watchman, to be placed in that position, assumes that you have some knowledge and understanding of the responsibility. Like, so cause I, this is going back to what I think Adam talked about or maybe something that Micah said, but, um, and you were talking about sins of omission and commission. Do you, you know, the watchmen understand. It's not like watchmen are on the wall and don't understand their responsibility. So for us to be there, we know, and this is why it's so important, if we don't blow the trumpet, how much that falls on us, right? This is why, like, us sort of ridding our garments of the blood of our generation, it's on us. And to be a watchman, we understand what's at stake. Um, so the sins of, of of omission are great because we do understand what what the um, the, the consequences are. It's already upon us as being a watchman. We understand that. Um, so are the watchmen worried that their trumpets will wake up sleeping people, for instance, or you know inconvenience people with their with their with their trumpets? Do you know what I mean? Like. And this is what the whole point of this whole thing is, is he's talking about, you know, blowing the trumpet unflinchingly. And um, if we don't make it, um, that make the true way clear to you, then we are blameless, right? So is the watchman on the wall worried that he's going to wake up a sleeping baby or a, 
you know, um, inconvenient someone with the trumpet? No. Um, I guess that's the struggle sometimes. So, right, as a watchman, is that that's the struggle. You can, maybe sometimes we are afraid to inconvenience people or to speak some harsh truths. But that's the job of the watchman is to blow the trumpet, regardless of how inconvenient it is for people who hear it. So, um, anyway. Um, also, what happens and... if a watchman is found asleep at the post? Dead. Yep. So is, yeah. isn't it worth the risk of waking someone up with blowing the trumpet versus just being over it and falling asleep because you'll die? And it's that risk reward, re reward again, right? Like like the watchman will be rewarded, but that failure, if you take on that responsibility or you shoot for that responsibility, that failure as a watchman, that's the that's the that's the the, the punishment, right? It's a, it's a big responsibility, um, but it's a worthwhile one, and. Um, we seem so to, I guess yeah. The, and he, we seem on. to understand that with everything except for the gospel. Like we understand that with the Watchmen, we understand it in sports, right? Like in sports, uh, in football, there's something called a crack block, where where somebody's coming to to kind of crack down on you and block you. And if you are a defender and you see this, your job is to scream crack as loud as you can at the guy in front of you to let him know that this thing is coming for him, to to so that he doesn't get blindsided by it, right? And uh, like everything, sports, vi video games, even a video game where it's like, we all understand that like, if we see an enemy coming and we're, we just go, <laughs> and we don't say anything and we just let this guy come in and hurt our teammate, we understand that our teammate probably going to hold us accountable, probably going to be a little bit upset. We don't care, right? We don't care. You might go, he's coming in, he's coming in. And then the teammate might go, hey, stop. Stop, you're being a little too loud, but we don't care. We just want to rid ourselves of this blood. But we understand it with everything except for the most important thing, spirituality. Then all of a sudden it's like, well, then God will forgive us. It doesn't matter. And it's like, this should be your loudest tower. Like this should be the one that you just instinctively knee jerk, just can't help yourself because this is the thing of the most eternal value. But mm. I, I don't know why it's hard for people to see that. Here's another yeah. here's another object lesson, if you will. Just quickly, I was just thinking there's there's actually two ways that we need to become cleansed in this life. The first one is the one that people focus on, which is we want to rid our garments of our own sins, blood, dirt, whatever you want to call it, through the Savior Jesus Christ. We're always focused on that. Like I'm sinning. I need the Savior to, to cleanse me, to cleanse me, to cleanse me. It's all about me, 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 me. But there's another form of blood and sins that fall upon us, which is from the blood and sins of this generation. And that only comes off us as we serve those people and say something and do something. Uh, otherwise, no matter how much we've prayed for forgiveness for what we have done, we're still going to be filthy from what we refused to have done for the blood and sins of those other people that are going to stain our garments. And there's some wonderful imagery of, was it in this week's, or was it Jacob? I think it was Jacob. In Jacob last week, chapter five to seven, he gets up at the end of his speech and he goes, I now take off my garments and I shake them before you so that I can visually show you that even though you might not be listening, I have ridden my garments of the blood and sins of your generation. So it's, it's a guy that got it. You know, it's not just his sins that he was worried about. It was the sins of the blood and sins of the, the people he was speaking to. So I think I like this visual visualization because it's a, it's far less selfish, constantly thinking about, okay, I got to be clean of my own sins, clean of my own sins. Actually, you got to be clean of the blood and sins of this whole generation. And the only way you're going to do that is by actually opening your mouth and warning them. So that should really help you understand why it's so important to actually open your mouth, regardless of whether or not you think they're going to listen or whether or not you think they're going to change. Mm. There's a scary thought that just came to my mind as you were saying that actually is we can repent of our own sins, but how do you repent of the sins of the blood of your generation that's on your garments? You know what I mean? Like, you can repent of your own sins, but if you fail to to warn or to do, you know, that, that blood ends up on your garments. How do you repent of those sins when when that's that's other people's blood? 
you know, on on your garments. It's an interesting and scary thought. I don't know that you can, right? Like, yeah, it's... Mm. I've, I've, What's the rest of the I've told you, you yeah. guys heard about my my biggest regret growing up was caused from that. Yeah, yeah, mm. that, that kid, and I was only like fourteen at the time. But yeah, no, I, I still think about that kid, and yeah, mm. how do you repent of that? Well, can I provide a scriptural example? Well, the sons no. of Moses. The sons. Uh, no, okay, that's all. All right, guys. <laughs> we don't do <laughs> scriptures here. No, was... <laughs> we don't do scriptures here. Sorry. <laughs> destroying the church and they spiritually destroyed the lives of every everyone that they came in contact with but after they had their change of heart they then did everything they possibly could to make restitution spent the rest and of also lives. Bring, as, bring as many people unto the lord as they could so and mm. Micah, you've done that you know chris and i we're trying to do it i hope we're doing it as well as we can and and so i think it's the change that's the change right we're trying now to do our best the lord can see the change he he, he will forgive but there needs to be some, obviously, some change. So we're doing it, brothers and sisters. I hope you join in that bandwagon, and and you not only rid yourself of your own sins, but also the blood and sins of this generation. Because without that, according to Brigham, this speech at Brigham Young was it? Yeah, Spence, President Spencer W. Kimball. If young people do not understand, then their then the fault may be partly ours. So if we're not helping these people around us understand the need for repentance and change and the things that we're supposed to help them understand, then we're partly to blame. So let's not be. You will be held accountable not only for your own sins, but those for whom you could have blessed had you been worthy. Is a, mm. a quote. That's a brutal responsibility. Yeah. yeah. So, yep. Yeah. All right. It's why it's so important to have other people around you to help you. Yeah, it's why it's so important. Got to, which Ammon's going to go over in our outro. Yes, <laughs> I am going to go over that. So thank you once again, brothers and sisters, for listening in with us, joining in, doing your own come follow me studies. We love you. We appreciate you. We are very, very blessed to be alive in this day, the days in which the Lord will perform his most wonderful works, the days directly before the Savior's second coming. And we are Zionobust, if it hasn't been clear, or as President Taylor mentions, the kingdom of God or nothing. We know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Lord's church, and we are doing everything we can to prepare the world for the Savior's second coming. You, your involvement here. If you are interested in learning more, if you are interested in linking arms with us, joining in, helping support one another in ridding the blood and sins of this generation from our garments, you can check us out on Discord, Facebook. Links always provided below. Share your insights with us. Come and join with us. We love you, brothers and sisters. Zion cannot be built without a body, a group of prepared, determined, sanctified saints without you we and can't watchmen. do it without you it ain't happening and if it ain't happening savior ain't coming and if the savior doesn't come or he chooses to come regardless he will waste the earth at his coming so let's not do that let's build zion we are the three brothers <laughs> And we love you very much. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you on the socials and see you again next week. Boop, boop.